Hey everyone! So it's been a while since I've had time to make another devlog video, but I thought I'd go ahead and do one. Just been really busy between work and school and other stuff. Um, I think I'm going to try and keep it to where I'm doing at least a devlog a month, just to keep it consistent. And that way I don't have a bunch of updates that pile on top of one another. Um, and it makes it a little more easier to just talk about stuff. So. I guess I'm just going to go ahead and just run through some of the newer stuff that I've been working on. Um, yeah, so the first thing is the editor's gotten quite a bit of an overhaul. That's really the biggest thing that I'm working on at the moment. First thing I started with was just making it look a little nicer. Um, I think it looks quite a bit better than it did before. It's still not perfect at all. Still a lot to work work on in terms of visuals, but I'm getting there, and I think it looks a lot more professional than it did before. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and create a new project for this demonstration. Just call it a project, have this compile. I've also increased the compile times. What I was doing before was making out calls to Visual Studio's compiler, but if, what I didn't realize at the time is that if you set up a shell and then call the compiler itself internally, what it does in the background, it spawn up a new instance of Visual Studio in order to do the compilation. So that's what was taking so long. It wasn't the compiling, it was just starting Visual Studio itself in the background. So I've cut that out and instead I'm using um, MS build in order to do the build. It's a lot faster and it doesn't have to go through the process of spawning up uh, an instance of Visual Studio. So we've compiled our project here. We have this ready to go. It's our YouTube project. So let's go and start doing some stuff. I'll go ahead and create... Let's see... We need a new scene to work in. So here's some of the new editor stuff. Uh, Pop-up windows. Um, very small, but now inside of the asset browser, which I have here, you can actually right click inside of the browser and you can create context sensitive, what well, gives you a context sensitive pop up window so you can start to edit stuff. So let's go ahead and create a new folder and we'll just make it a scenes folder. Uh, by default, whenever you create a new project, by the way, it gives you this cache folder. I'll probably delete that. I think it's pretty superfluous at this point. That's kind of legacy, so not really necessary. It's really just there if um, you create a new asset and I don't have an explicit path set up for you inside of here, then it just dumps it into a cache folder. But probably get rid of that. Uh, let's create a new scene and we'll just call it uh, our test scene. So the way I used to have assets is that they were all .e assets. Um, I've changed that a little bit just so they're easier to see on disk. I'll go ahead and open up this actually. So here's our project that's created. Assets, scenes, we have this .e scene. Makes it a lot easier instead of everything just being a .e asset, they can actually have their own file extensions. So it makes it a lot easier to tell what exactly they are. Um, I'm not exactly sure if I want to keep the naming convention to the way it is right now. Um, I haven't decided yet, but that's not super important. That's just more or less just a, uh, a preference thing. Let me go ahead and collapse this a little bit because we don't need this anymore. Okay, so we've created our new scene. Um, the way I have it set up here is that you can actually interact with these assets inside of the asset browser. It's a little janky the way I do it right now. Uh, right now it just looks for the file path and then it finds a Asset, an asset that is registered with that file path or the asset file path that has a lot of issues just because it's a string comparison itself I'm gonna rewrite all of this but for now the way it works is um, you have a couple of options you can rename it um, you can select it and then you can double click on it and it'll interact with it in a certain way depending on what the asset is so for scenes it'll go through and actually load the scene for us and you can see down here that it lets you know that this is the scene that's currently being viewed and then also in the world outliner we have that up there as well. So let's go ahead and create just a couple of entities. So you notice this is different. It actually 
has a little selection for you, um, show you that the entity that you have. Uh, same thing here, you can hit F2 and you can rename this guy. So, uh, well, I'll just re keep it that. I'm going to go ahead and create another entity. Another way you can create entities is you could go up here to do this. You create empty entities and all this kind of stuff. Right now, these are very, they're not finalized the way this is. This is just uh, kind of a placeholder. You can do that, you can hit Control D as well. It'll copy an entity, does a deep copy, copies uh, all of its properties, copies all of its components, gives it a new UUID, so it's an actual unique entity. I'm gonna go ahead and shrink this guy down. Extend him out a little bit, and let's rename him. This will be our floor. Scale him up a little bit more, okay. And that, and let's make it to where he will not move. We can set his mass to zero, and we come up to file. We can now save our scene, save that, and then if we hit play, so now we have the cube here. It's falling and falling onto the floor. Okay, nothing new, <clears throat> but they are kind of boring. So I'd like to give them maybe some new materials, maybe look a little nicer. So I can show off some new stuff that I've done with that. So let's go ahead and create a new folder. We'll call that our materials folder. And inside of here, we'll create a couple of new folders. So create a mahogany floor and an octostone. So I actually have some textures here that I'm gonna bring into the deep um, project. It's really easy to bring in new assets. Um, all you have to do is just select the ones you want and drag those into project, and you can see that it's imported those. We can do the same for our Octostone over here. Select these guys, drag them in, and it's importing those. Those are all imported correctly. You can right click and create our new materials. I'm going to follow the uh, Unreal Engine uh, method of naming materials. I'll create that. I'll create a mahogany floor material. Okay. So our materials are set up in that they're created, but we don't have a way to actually set them up right now. So what I've created, this is actually a really large part of the editor process, is the ability to have I wanted a unique way, or uh, let me rephrase that. I wanted a good concrete way of being able to edit assets, and I didn't want to have um, everything tied to the same window. I really like, you know, having multiple editor windows, being able to edit multiple scenes at a time if I needed to, have different worlds. So, one big thing that I've worked on recently is the ability to have again multiple editor windows. So, if you double click on the material asset, what it does is it pulls up a material edit window for you and this gives you ability to actually edit the properties of the material. And what this has inside of it is that I've created a concept of worlds. So um, every single window owns a world or belongs to a world rather. And m multiple windows can share multiple worlds. They don't necessarily have to have their own. The material windows themselves have their own world. And the reason for that is that you can have this renderable here, which is uh, the sphere that will show the material for it, but it's not actually polluting the main game world. If I actually look around in here, inside of this material window, he's at zero, zero, zero uh, in terms of world space, and so is this guy, but you're not going to actually see it. Very important because um, there are engines that I've seen before that actually do something like that where they'll all share the same world and they try some pretty kludgy ways in order to get it to not show up inside of the main scene you know having uh, different layers that entities actually uh, get put into and then cameras are actually interested in rendering I didn't want to do anything like that I thought it was a lot cleaner to be able to have world instances and then be able to um, edit things that way within the world so this is what I've set up here What's great about this is that, again, it's a separate world instance, it's a separate scene, 
um, and everything is governed by what I call contexts within the world. So the graphics subsystem gives out context. I can actually show that what that looks like. I go to the graphics subsystem. I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit so it's easier to read. But there is a graphic subsystem context. So whenever the world is created, let's see. So the world itself has a um, context map, which is just a bunch of uh, just a list of subsystem contexts that are actually hashed by their um, object types, which are governed by the uh, meta class system. So it puts those, it registers the context map, checks to make sure that it doesn't have the context first, and then it'll create a new type. What the graphic subsystem context does is it has its own back buffer, so it's an actual render target, it's the actual viewport target, and it has an object ID buffer so that you can do object picking within, inside of the viewport. It also has its own scene, and then the scene itself has um, its own camera and various other things, uh, renderable contexts, static meshes, skeletal animation, uh, meshes, and things like that. So it's completely separated depending on the world, and this is all owned by a specific world. For the material editor window, whenever I actually construct the material editor window, it grabs the world which is created in the initialization of the world. The world actually registers whatever context it wants. So if it wants a physics context, it can register that, and then the physics subsystem will know to handle that differently. Um, if it wants a graphic subsystem context, if it wants an audio, um, and also a GUI context. So each of these windows have their own IAM GUI context as well, which you can see is why the editor and this actually look very similar. It's because they're handled exactly the same way in the back end. They're just able to have their own um, IAM GUI context with their own viewport windows and whatever else. Makes it really easy to be able to extend this stuff. Uh, in a very natural way of being able to actually code it, which is great. So back to this, we want to set up these materials. So the way that the materials work is very similar to um, uh, Stingray does. Stingray has, which I don't know if anyone's ever seen Stingray, it's, it was uh, the BitSquid engine and then got bought by Autodesk and now it's completely out of commission. They've canceled the project unfortunately. But it had a lot of really good ideas, and one that I really liked from it was the shader graph approach, which is it's very similar to Unreal's, Unreal's master material, and you make instances based off of that, right? Um, but the shader graph itself is not necessarily a material, and that's the same in my case. What happens is that materials are associated with shader graphs, and all shader graphs are just a collection of shader passes, a collection of uh, parameters or uniforms, you know, depending on the graphics API that you're using, and it lets the material know how it needs to render itself. That's basically it. So by default, um, the engine for any asset creates a default asset. So this is the default shader graph, and it's really simple. It has almost nothing in it. It has standard outputs for all the PBR out, uh, inputs. So uh, albedo is just a white color. It has constant values for roughness and metallicness. There's no emission. Um, the ambient occlusion is just set to white. Basic stuff like that. Um, I don't have a way inside of the engine yet to be able to create new shader graphs, but that is probably the next thing that I will work on. Now that I have these editor windows that can, I can actually create on the fly and then be able to set up uh, specific worlds with them and different viewports and then can actually uh, isolate and encapsulate a lot of this logic and a lot of the way that this stuff works make it a lot easier in the future. Uh, I do have one that's written statically um, which I can actually show you here. Let's go ahead and find it. If I go to instead of here I do have a default shader graph. It's just SG. All it is is a JSON file. So the standard format for these things is you get a uh, shader graph name, which is just uh, default static geom for this one. It has a list of nodes. These nodes are actually what are going to be used inside of the shader graph. So here we have an albedo map, 
a normal map, metallic map. I actually showed this off in a previous video, so I'm not going to go too in depth with it, but um, just to kind of give an overview for what these things actually do. Then we have node links. Um, I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit, easier to see. So we have node links. This just tells the system, whenever it's actually done constructing the nodes, how it needs to hook these nodes up. So we see that we have the emissive multiplier. It has uh, inputs into it, which is the emissive intensity, which is just going to be a float node. Um, and then the emissive map as well, so it's just multiplying those two together. And then here are the main node. Um, we have inputs into that. Um, so base color, that's your albedo color, normal, metallic, roughness, basically all the default stuff that you would expect to see in a material editor, shader graph editor, um, visual instance. And then we have a thing for default overrides down here. Um, and then just says that if I don't have any information, you know, I can override specifically what certain properties need to need to become. So with that, let's go back to the material. So let's go ahead and select this guy. So again, you see these mappings down here. Now, as soon as I set it to um, a new shader graph, what happens is that it destroys all the previous properties that it had, all the previous um, parameter overrides, which are what these are here and it constructs new ones based on the shader. So it looks at the shader graph, the material holds its own overrides, and then whenever you're actually going through to bind the material, what happens is that the material instance itself binds its own properties to be used inside of the shader itself. So for here we have the albedo map, metallic map, all those different properties that you saw earlier. And what we can do now is inside of here, we can actually start to fill these out. Um, so let's see, this is our Octostone. So let's go ahead and just search for that. We have a search filter here. So we'll go ahead and populate this. Do the metallic, the albedo, the normal. We have a roughness. Uh, there is no emissive. So I'm just going to go ahead and give this a black texture. And there is an AO, I believe. And spell correctly, there we go. Then the AO. So there we go. So now we have our material set up, and once we're done, we can come up here and save the material, and then close that out. And let's go ahead and apply it to this guy. Right now, this process right here, I am not happy with at all. This is all just very default and generic stuff. This will look a lot nicer in the future. Um, I want a couple ways to be able to set the material for any particular mesh. One would be to from the asset browser um, be able to drag on the material that you want. Also this view here is also very default and, and placeholder right now. What I'll probably have is an actual asset, or have an actual directory listing here on the side that you can navigate through and then on the right side of that it probably have um, like an icon list and you can actually see icons for what these assets are. <clears throat> so it look a lot nicer and it's a lot easier to be able to, to reason about. But for now, um, we have this. So the way that meshes used to work is they used to hold one material and that was it. That had to change because um, of a fairly large um, subsystem implementation that I did, which was the animation subsystem, which I'll show off here in a little bit. So right now the way that meshes actually work is that they, the meshes themselves are a collection of sub meshes, and each sub mesh is a draw call itself. And in order to do optimization, I end up sorting my sub mesh and you know uh, sort my material within that, so you don't have to bind multiple materials um, uh, different times. You should just be able to do one bind. So there's a lot of optimizations that uh, are done there, and further optimizations can be done in the future. But for now, that's a pretty big one. So if we look in here, this thing only has one material element. Um, and we have our materials down here. We just made the Octostone. Let's go ahead and select that guy. So there we go. OK, and let's go ahead and set our next one up, which is the mahogany floor. Again, we'll give it that same shader graph. And we'll search for the shader that we need. No metallic map for that. There's a roughness. There's no emissive either.
And for AO, I don't think there's an AO map. Yeah, there is. Okay, we'll give it that. Save that one out. And we'll set that. It's a little dark, but that works. Um, inside of our scene, actually, we can create... Let's see, let's make a directional light. Of course, because it's so rough, it's actually really difficult to see because it's more specular than anything. It's not necessarily taking on too much of the light. So let's go ahead and do this just to make it easier to see. Let's give it a different rough map. Let's use this guy's. Yeah, I think that looks cool. Now it kind of looks like it's a dingy floor. So let's use that. And let's shut down this guy. We don't need it anymore. Let's save the material. Okay. And we'll save our scene. And we hit play, and it works exactly the same. Just as you would expect. Okay. Um, so there we go. So that's the uh, material editing right now. Again, very kind of basic. This was really just to work up the ability to be able to have multiple window support within the editor. So what this shows is, again, like I said, now it's really easy to be able to further customize the editor and be able to add in um, just tons of different options for editing specific things. This opens up a lot of doors. Uh, and I'm excited for what I'll be working on um, later on. I'm going to have... Uh, I'm split between whether or not I'm going to work on the shader graph editor first because I've done something similar to that before at work and that was a lot of fun to work on, but it is a lot of work so it'll probably take me a while. Um, or if I'll work on something like um, an, uh, what I'm calling an archetype editor. Ar archetypes are basically what my prefabs are going to be or what blue blueprints are going to be. So I'd like to have a dedicated editor for being able to set those things up. So I'm not sure which one I'm going to work on yet, but um, it'll be one of those two most likely. Okay, so let's see. There are some code path things as well that I added that I actually wanted to show off. One of those had to do with collision callbacks. So it's very useful inside of uh, any kind of game to be able to know when an object has collided with another one, whenever it's still colliding, whenever it's entered a trigger, whenever it's left a uh, it's left a collision, you know, something like that. So I've added a way to be able to do that. So let's actually open up. Uh, well, first let's let's create a component that'll handle something like that for us. So let's call this debug collision report component. Let's look at this. So again, it generates that code for us. And let's actually open up this guy. So this is our project. So our debug collision report component. So the way that, let's go ahead and look at the rigid body component actually. I have this callback here. Um, it's a collision callback. It's basically just a void function pointer. Um, or it's a, yeah, so it's a void function, um, but it expects to take certain things inside of it, which is a, a pointer to the component that's actually being used for the callback, and then a, a collision report. And a collision report, it's very simple. Let's see, I can find it. Nope, you're not going to give it to me. There we go. So, collision report is very simple. Um, right now it just holds a pointer to a collider. Eventually, later on, it's going to hold a lot more information that would be very useful for you. Um, contact points, uh, normals for those contact points, positions in world space, maybe even local space positions for the contact points. 
So a lot of different stuff. But for right now, um, just to show that this is up and working, I just have the collider there. What's useful about that is that you can get information about the entity because every component holds a reference to its the entity that holds it. So as soon as you have this particular rigid body component from the collision, then you can go ahead and get back the entity as well. So for the rigid body component, it holds various callbacks. So it has collision enter, exit, and overlap callbacks. Um, these work exactly, uh, I think, as you would probably expect, which is that once you enter a collision, you know you, you call you have uh, callbacks for that. Once you exit. You know, callbacks for that, and then once you do uh, overlaps, you do that as well. And these are handled actually inside of the physics subsystem themselves. So inside of our check collisions, so it goes through and it gets a bunch of contact manifolds that are actually occurring within the scene. Uh, Bullet gives me this information, and then through that, I'm actually able to. Um, do some various checks within here to run through and set off different events that I need to. So if um, there was no contact previously inside of contact events that I was actually having registered within the physics subsystem, then I grab those two components and I do on collision enter for both of those, each of them having the other component as the collider that um, is registered with the other one. Um, same thing, if we decide that the new contact list is actually missing a contact that was previously, then that means that we have exited for this frame, so then we do the same thing. And if uh, it's still there, it was determined in this frame that there were contacts that were existing in the previous one, then we have the on-collision overlap. And then this, all the this stuff is cleaned up whenever um, the physics subsystem is shut down at the end of run. So with that being said, let's go ahead and go back into the YouTube project and we'll go ahead and write some collision callbacks here. So these can be named whatever you'd like, but it's important to have the collision report be the only parameter that it accepts and it needs to um, have no return value. Then we'll make an exit as well and an overlap. Again, you can name these whatever you'd like, does not matter. And we'll go into our source file here and fill these out. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and type this correctly. And one more. Okay. So let's go ahead and just fill these out. So the report itself, it gives you back a collider. The collider is a rigid body component. So let's go ahead and cache that. And then from that, like I was saying, you can go ahead and get the entity that that belongs to. And what we're going to do is, for each of these, we're just going to print out what that entity is. Just by getting its name. Which is the name that we actually have for the label inside of the editor. If we come back here, look at this, so it'll be you know one of these names that we see up here. I'm going to go ahead and copy this, and we'll just go ahead and just change this depending on what it is. Okay, so the way this works is on start, this actually needs to register with the rigid body component. So what we'll do is on this entity, we'll grab its component. I'm in trouble typing today. 
we're gonna make we're gonna check and see if the rigid body component exists for now. This is no longer necessary, and I'll show you that in a second why it's not. But for now, we're just gonna go ahead and make sure that this um, component actually exists. And if it does, we're gonna go ahead and add these callbacks. So the format for these is that they are templated, so they do expect the type. So it's going to be of type this component. We're going to pass in a pointer to this component, and then we're going to give it a pointer to the function that we're actually going to call, and it's going to be our on collision enter function. Simple as that. And we'll do the same thing for the on collision exit callback and overlap callbacks. And we'll change these down here. And that should be it. So let's go ahead and come back to our game. There we go. And we'll compile this, make sure that everything compiles correctly. There we go. So you notice how much faster this compiles now. Uh, it's great. It used to take, uh, geez, upwards of 15 seconds or so just because it was spawning that process. It's a lot faster now. I'm very happy with that. Uh, I think it can still be faster, but it's it's a hell of a lot better. Okay, so we have this guy. Let's go ahead and pop this up. We'll hit play. And so now we're overlapping the floor. If we pause this, actually. Still overlapping with it. If I drag him up, you see that we have the exit collision there on the left. If I overlap with them, then everything seems to be working correctly. And it's probably tough to see because we're just getting spammed with the overlap, but we're also inside of there. We are getting the started collision with the floor callback as well. So that is that working. And like I said earlier, is we did this check here for the rigid body component. Not necessarily important to do anymore because I've added a property tag for components. Um, so the meta class type for all components now derives from meta class. It's actually a meta class component type. And what that allows you to do is hold a require list for various other components. Unity allows you to do this. I don't think Unreal does. But Unity does at least, and I really like that. So what I can do is, since I know that I need this thing to be able to register with a rigid body component, I'm going to require that if this entity does not have the rigid body component, whenever I create the debug collision component or report component and attach it to it, the engine itself is going to go through and create this particular component and it's going to um, attach it. And this is actually a list so I can continue to add stuff here um, as many as I need for this particular component. So I can remove this check actually because it's superfluous because I know that this thing should have the rigid body component. Okay. And let's go back to here, we will recompile it. Good to go. Should work all the same. It does. Great. Okay. So, the last thing that I'll probably show off for now is like I was saying earlier, I got animations working. It's the animation subsystem. So I'm going to show off some of that real quick. So I'm going to create a characters folder. Let's create one. This is a Mixamo character. And let's see. So we'll have animations for this guy. Um, he'll have a mesh as well. He can also come here. Uh, let's create another folder for materials. So. So 
inside of here we have an FBX file for this vampire. So I'm going to go ahead and drag him in. <clears throat> so one thing I did add is the ability to have an import process. This was necessary for animations and skeletal meshes in particular because the way that they're imported animations rely on skeletal animation or relies on skeleton information in order to be able to fill out certain joint structures that it needs to be able to reference. So this process was important and what I've done here is that this is actually an opt-in process whenever you drag something in if that particular asset has a way that it wants to be imported specifically then it'll take over and then do this for it. If it doesn't then it does like the textures do right now which you saw which is it just does a default import process. So for a skeletal mesh, what it does is it'll look and see if it does have a valid skeleton that can be imported, if it has a valid mesh, a valid mesh, and you can select which ones you want there. So for now, we're going to go ahead and import both of those. And so down here we have the .eskl and then .eskm. I'm not sure if I like these asset extensions. I might actually just write them out fully. I was trying to keep them to uh, being four letters long for each asset extension, although the scenes have kind of broken that. So I'm not sure. Um, haven't decided, but we'll see in the future what I decide to go with. But for now, that's what they are. So we have those. Let's go ahead and bring in some animations as well. Um, come over here. We have four different animations for this guy. So again, I'm just going to go ahead and select all of those and drag them in. And you'll notice that now this is a different import window here because the animations govern that. So we're going to import the animation from that. And then here is a drop down list of all the different skeletons that are actually in the uh, asset system at, at the moment. Right now we just have the one, so I'm just going to select that. Right now this is important that it is a one to one match between the animation skeleton that it needs to reference as well as what the skeletal mesh is. Um, I would like to make that a little more robust in the future. It's way too error prone at the moment. It's it it breaks with different names as well, which is it shouldn't have to do that. It should just look for hierarchy structure. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, but that is something I'll work on in the future. So let's go ahead and import all of these, and they'll all use the same settings. So now that's all imported, and we also have a materials folder here. So let's just go ahead and textures and we'll just drag all this in and again these don't have a very particular import process um, they just use the default one and we'll make a vampire material okay we can go ahead and set up this material Uh, with our diffuse there, which we'll just use that for the albedo. We do not have a metallic, so I'll just use whatever. Our ref map we don't have as well. We have a specular. It's not necessarily what we want, but we'll use that. We have an emission, and for AO, again, we don't have anything, so I'll just use white. And just to show the emission there, intensity working, that multiplier that's actually getting multiplied within that node that I was talking about earlier. But for now, since I don't have a way to create a new shader graph that I would like to be able to actually use these masks correctly, I'm just going to set that to 1. And I'll go ahead and save this. So here we go. So let's go ahead and show the process right now for creating something with a skeletal mesh. So I'll just create an empty entity here. We can actually rename this guy. Let's just call him Vampire. Okay, and we'll go ahead and add uh, we could do two things. We could add a skeletal mesh component and then add the animation component. The skeletal animation component requires that a skeletal mesh be present. So this has the require tag actually on the definition for the skeletal animation component itself. So if I click on the animation component, you'll see that it's actually added a mesh component for me. So that way there's no way to actually be able to uh, mess that up. So let's select our vampire here. We'll go ahead and select, um, let's see, this. We can select the animation that we want. There is also an issue right now that because the animation subsystem um, gets all of the joint transform information from the animation itself, 
it's not using any default information to send off the shader, so if you don't have an animation selected, it's not rendering anything. That's a known bug and something that I'll work on once I start making the animation subsystem more robust. I have plans to add blend trees and have specific editors for all of that. It's just going to take time to get all that set up. So let's go ahead and create the idle, or let's set the idle animation. And these things get imported quite large because they're actually at a centimeter scale instead of a meter scale. So I'll drag that down. And get them set a little better. There we go. And so now we have our vampire with the idle animation playing. Uh, some very loose controls right now. A lot of these are just for debugging. Um, right here you can see the animation time. It's a non-normalized value. It just shows the entire uh, animation length as it's running through. And then for the animation speed, I can actually speed that up. And you can see I'm jittering a little bit there, or you can slow it down. Uh, it's really interesting if you actually take this to a negative value. Let's see if I can, actually. Yeah, there we go. So the, inter <laughs> the interpolations get kind of wonky. But anyway, so we have these materials set up. So like I was saying earlier, this thing has two static or two sub meshes in the mesh itself. Um, it has one for I think his body and then also one for his clothing. So I think we can yeah, so there we go. So we have this sub mesh right here, his clothing mesh, I just set it to just some random thing. We can actually use the octostone material we did earlier, or we can use the mahogany floor. Get some different effects. And then he also has a body as well. We can actually set that to his. But let's go ahead and set them both to what they're supposed to be. So there we go. So now we have our vampire in. He's anim animating. And uh, he has the correct material set up for him. We'll go ahead and save our scene. We'll play again. Make sure everything's good. And it's working fine. And through here, we can actually select different animations. So there's our run animation. We got a sword swing animation as well. And then a basic walk animation. So there we go with that. And again, none of these are blending. Right now, they are explicitly being, um, being set just within this itself. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done for the animation subsystem uh, before I mean, even close to consider it being uh, usable, I would say. But this is just to show that it's starting to work. So, And one thing that I did add was inside of here for the world outliner, the ability to be able to parent objects to one another, which is uh, very useful. So let's go ahead and create another cube here. And let's remove some superfluous stuff. We don't need this. Create this guy. We can create another one here. So we'll just call this guy child. And he can be child too. So for this, all you need to do is as you drag things around, you'll get different debug information here telling what you can cannot attach to. Obviously, an entity cannot attach it to itself, um, but we can attach it to any of these other entities here. As we do that, we get a drop down here, and then clicking on that will collapse that. It'll show you the structure. As I move this guy around, you'll notice now that he is actually controlling the transform information for this guy, because it's relative to him. If I unparent it, then you can see that now he's no longer controlling it. So pretty standard and it seems to work fairly well. The only issue that I have right now is that all of this stuff is locked to being in local space transformation. I would like a way to be able to do world space as well. That way I can actually pick this guy up and be able to move him around a lot more accurately than I can right now. Um, but that's a known bug and it's actually fairly simple to fix. So I will have that done. And we can go ahead and attach this guy to him as well. And so if I move the entire chain now or rotate it or scale it, then they all do so appropriately with one another. 
And of course, if I save the scene and then play, then they all move in accordance to this other guy. And we can make him bouncy. And play it. And now they all bounce together. So, there we go. And I think that's about it. There's uh, there's probably a lot of stuff underneath um, system-wise that's just kind of difficult to show because it's really hard to, to show that visually. But for the most part, um, this is what all has been going on. And I'll continue to work on it. And like I said, hopefully every month or so, um, have at least some kind of small video showing some update. Um, I'll try to stick to that. So. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it, and I appreciate all the comments. Um, yeah, thank you.